Hey, Life Group leaders, it is great to be with you. I'm really pumped for Sunday. I think we have over 150 volunteers signed up so far. So if you haven't, here's the QR code. You can sign up now. But uh, the other thing you need to just think about in the city series is what project you as a Life Group are going to get involved in. Uh, and if you haven't given any feedback to Sia around which area you want to get involved in, what sort of your passion project is, then please make sure you do that so that we can help connect you into an NGO through We Are Durban. But if you've watched people get baptized, you'll see they go under, and as, as they go under, or just before they go under, the pastor or whoever's doing the baptism will say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's a Trinitarian concept. It's uh, you are being submerged into the person of God, the threeness of God. And we started on the Trinity through, through the concept of how do we love people. We said all of that comes from the Trinity and a view of who God is. And this week I've had lots and lots of questions on the Trinity from various people. And so I, I thought I'd just kick off with a little more experience explanation on the Trinity, and then I'll dive into the implications of worshiping this Trinity God. The first thought is this. The word for God, it says, in the beginning, God, the word there is Elohim. That word is a plural. So it's it's used again in um, in Exodus 23. It says, you shall have no other Elohim before me, no other gods. So the word in the beginning, God, and the word in Exodus, the, you'll have no other gods, is exactly the same word. The im, Elohim, that part uh, suggests or speaks to plurality. When we think of God, we think of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But people said to me, so uh, I had this question this week, so which one's more God? The Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit. And in Colossians, it says this in verse 15, one, chapter 1, verse 15. It says, Jesus is the exact image, living image, the essential manifestation of the unseen God, the visible representation of the invisible, the firstborn, the preeminent one, the sovereign, and the originator of all creation. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who arise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God, in all his fullness, was pleased to live in Christ. God lived in the body of Christ. That's what it's saying. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. When we think God, we think God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but they are God, one. They are singular in terms of the, the role they play, but they are in essence exactly the same. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Basically, what he's saying is, if you cut me and you cut the Father, what comes out is exactly the same. I was trying to explain this to a person the other day, and I put three cans of Coke in front of her, and I said, the essence of this is exactly the same as the essence of this is exactly the same as the essence of this. The, the thing inside is absolutely the same. The expression is different. The roles are different. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit express themselves differently, but their essence is absolutely the same. So, firstly, they, they are exactly the same. Secondly, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are connected. Now, this is probably harder for us to understand because we are physical beings and not, uh, we, we don't see the spiritual. But what we know because of Jesus' prayer, where he prays, he says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, 
that the world may believe that you have sent me. The, the concept is this, that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are so essentially, in essence, the same and so completely connected, one in spirit. The spirits kind of rub over one another. It's the same words that, that's used for when a man and wife come together, they become one flesh. The, the concept's exactly the same, that the spiritually, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. It's why when Christ was on the cross, it says that God was reconciling mankind to himself in Christ. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. The, the concept is that God ex exists entwined in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And before God made the world, they or he, the oneness of God, had already aligned to make a decision that Jesus would go to the cross. There's nothing that is done in the Godhead that is not completely agreed in complete alignment. There's no one operating on by themselves because they are in one another. Now, I'm stressing this because I want us to think about and imagine you know, Jesus says this, he says, I pray that they'll be one as we are one. I want us to imagine our community and what God dreams of it. See, if you read in Ephesians 4, it says this, Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you've been called by God. Always be humble and gentle, be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourself united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. Make every effort to keep the oneness that we receive from God. Jesus in the Father, the Father in him, them in us. Keep that oneness as an overflow of God into the world. So, Jesus says, that the world will know that you are my disciples. The concept is this. It's beautiful. It's that the way we treat each other is so utterly vital to the oneness of God being us in us and reflecting or showing himself off through us that we have to literally, with fear and trembling, protect our relationships. We must serve one another. We must care for one another. We must fight to keep the bond of peace so that the spirit can indwell us as a community. When you, when you think about it this way, when you think that literally God longs for people who are completely united, knit together in spirit so that he can show himself off, when you think of it that way, it should change the way you think about your life groups. So the first question is this. Does this shift how you see your life group? Maybe take a moment down and jot three or four thoughts or implications of the Trinity on how you see community. Now, I want to take it a step further. You know, often when the pastor says, we're going to talk about reaching the lost, what people think is we're going on a marketing campaign and uh, it, it lacks any heart, it feels forced and, and we feel like, oh, they're making us do this thing again to go and reach more people. And, and we completely miss the heart of the Trinity. God's intent for the world, I guess, is wrapped up in the Trinity. Because the Trinity shows us that God created man for a relationship with him. And though man consistently turned away, God's intent never changed. And the cross is the greatest expression of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit working together to bring mankind back into relationship with him. The Father initiated the plan of redemption. We see that. The Son accomplished it in the atonement, and the Holy Spirit is applying it to individuals. In other words, all of the Trinity 
are working together to reach the lost. And therefore, when we obey Jesus' call into God's mission, we don't just do it for God to earn brownie points. We do it with God to bring people back to a father who has lost sons and daughters. The parable or the, the story that Jesus tells about the lost son or the prodigal son who races off, squanders all his wealth and then comes back is a story that really represents God's heart. The father who in patriarchal world would never run, runs out of his house. The, the father who has lost so much to the son reaches out and says, kill the fattened calf and bring the robe and, and bring a ring, reestablishing the identity of the son. This is a story of reaching the lost. It's a story of a trinity who long to be one with people, the people they've created. And so the question needs to be, how are you doing as individuals and as life groups, as a life group, in demonstrating the trinity in reaching more people and bring them into your group. Okay, last thought about this trinity. In Titus, the writer says, Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. The meaning is clear. We've been bought and no longer belong to ourselves or the world. We belong to God. So God, who is a community on mission, has a people who belong to him that he indwells by his spirit. And therefore, when Jesus said those famous words, all authority on heaven, in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples, he was not giving us a piece of advice he was giving us an order that went something like this. You're part of this family now, the Trinity. And as part of this family, the thing we do is mission. It's who we are as a family. Now, I've watched life groups over many, many years, and I've studied Jesus' life group. Jesus' life group lasted three years, and then he sent his disciples all over the world to go and make churches and life groups in essence should be a place like an incubator I guess that raises people up and then sends them out and sometimes you send them out in twos and sometimes in fours and sometimes in sixes but but we should be raising people and sending them it's part of what it means to be a fully functional healthy life group if, if you never sent anybody and you never brought new people into your life group you would just be you, you would you'd be a family with no babies. It's, it's just not right. It's not normal. It wouldn't be being a missional community or a missional family. You, you wouldn't be being who God is. And so I'd like us to have a conversation because we come from this incredible trinity who invites us into this unbelievable relationship and then calls us to make these relationships grow. He calls us to mission. I want us to have a chat about our life group. And when we last sent someone to start something new, or when we last invited new people in, and who's kind of feeling a sense in God, it's time for me to step up and lead something, start an alpha. I'm running an alpha at the moment. It's so much fun. I just, I just want to encourage people. Why don't you, in this next season, we've got a whole church of people who would love to be in life groups. They need to be invited in. Why don't you... Let God speak to you and take a step to become the oneness giver that we're called to be. I hope this conversation makes your life group multiply.